it's absolutely great to have you here. There are so many things I want to talk to you about, but let's start off with a view of the VC market. Funding overall is down. Valuations are down, and not just since the implosion of Silicon Valley Bank. How are you seeing the world right now? Well, you know, I think interlocking is really beautiful, so it's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's my second trip here, and it's still very beautiful. Yes. <laughs> but you know, I think the way I would describe the State of the Union today is A, B, C. Meaning? A stands for AI. Mm -hmm. B, banking crisis. C, which is very relevant to startups, cash. So without cash, nothing happens. And it's really difficult for many, also very promising startups, to get cash, A, B, C funding, and you're in, in the early stage investments, in the VC stage, but in the past there has been this, you know, probably the overfeeding of many startups that weren't so promising. Is it a good thing that cash is coming down, the funding volumes are coming down, because what you're investing in now makes a lot more sense? You know, I think they say I do a lot of uh, water sports, so when we do water sports, when the tide is in, you don't see the rocks. Yeah. When the tide goes to go out, you see a lot of rocks. That's kind of where we are. Mm -hmm. We had way too much money floating. Yeah. And I think it lost discipline, which in create the uh, pricing and valuation that was probably way too higher than should be. Mm -hmm. And so now it's overcorrection that's going on. Last year, basically, the amount of investment went down by half. Yeah. So which means, relatively speaking, the valuation is coming down. But actually, if you think about 2022, 70 to 80% of SaaS companies, software companies, their valuation went down in public sector. And I think the private sector is just catching up. So we have more to go down, in my view. More to go down. More valuation go down. correction will go down further. Yes, because the... Basically, the cash squeeze is going to continue. I think early stage is less of a concern, mm -hmm. but later stage companies uh, will have more issues, in my view. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of a function of how much money they have, how much their money spent. And you know, people talk about unicorns. Yep. And unicorn isn't some mystic cow with the one you know, uh, thing in Switzerland somewhere in Interlaken. <laughs> But um, actually, I counted how many unicorns are in Switzerland. And? And there are seven. Seven? Seven. Not bad. Yeah. Actually, in worldwide, there are 1,200. Mm -hmm. 1,206 as of last year. And uh, most of them are still in America. So w why is that? I mean, that's, that's the perennial question. Why are there more unicorns in the US than anywhere in Europe combined? I think part of this is really about the um, ambition. So if you look at entrepreneurs in Asia or Europe, they tend to look at the local market. Whereas if you look at the entrepreneurs in US, they think global, they think big, and therefore they are much more ambitious. So it's around how you look at the market and how also you build a team. US teams typically is a highly, highly global team. And so you will see Swiss, you will see French, you will see Koreans and Japanese, they all combine into one working. Whereas I think if you look at even our investment in antibiotics in Switzerland, they are really virtually, you know, Swiss team. So one of our goal is working with the local companies that has the potential to be a global player and helping them to accelerate. But I'm trying to think here, isn't that too much of a cliche, the Americans think global, the Europeans think local. Don't we have the same sort of, you know, if, if you're a founder, if you have that mentality, why shouldn't European companies succeed at the same rate as US companies? Isn't there something else, another factor? I mean, it must be funding something else? Yeah, so really good point. So I actually been involved with European companies for a long time. And I am actually to say two companies that are really important companies that Europe create. One is a company called Arm Holdings, which I was a supervisory board member of and built a company over the years and become de facto standard. Every one of you carry Arm in your pocket because the processor behind in your mobile phone 
is based on ARM that was produced or designed by Apple or Samsung and then produced by either Samsung or TSMC. So this is an example of how global this business is. So when you're designing products or service, you want to go after the whole market. Uh, whereas if often you find the uh, entrepreneurs that are looking at how do I optimize Germany first? How do I optimize the French market first? Then you become local team, and local team has its own limitations. Mm -hmm. So would that be your one key piece of advice to Swiss entrepreneurs to, to, or to Swiss startups in a way? Think global, think outside of the box? I think there Is are, it that easy? No, I think there are three or four things. Okay. Just because you can say go global doesn't mean you can go global. No. I think you have to mix the people. And you have to mix the people in this room too. You know, if you want to you know, make Swiss Economic Forum international, then maybe you can add more of me in the room, mm -hmm. be able to mix up and being able to bring new ideas then maybe uh, help you to change the dynamics. I'm not saying it's good or bad, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of what you want mm -hmm. and what you're comfortable with. I've got a great audience question here that ties into this. Is the European and Swiss fear of failure a significant element of reduced early stage investment here? Yeah, I think culturally, I think someone said yesterday, you know how Germans like to make sure everything works, uh, ends degree, mm -hmm. and I think this is why, uh, you know, Buying a German car is great, because you know it works, and it's reliable. So it has the advantage of that perfection, and Japanese cars too. But the problem in a digital world, most things are moving much faster. So you have to go through much more testing. Sometimes it doesn't work out. And so in that area of experimentation, in the digital world, using the technologies, then I think the business model have to change. So depend on industry, mm -hmm. or I think the speed matters a lot, and I think Elon Musk has shown in auto industry what's possible mm -hmm. by bringing, basically all he did was all the technology that was developed in mobile phone and bring it into auto industry. Mm -hmm. You talked about that mentality shift, and I think it has been very much visible in Korea and your home country where you know, it used to be, I guess, more of a mindset similar to Japan or Germany and now morphed into this extremely innovative country that's dominating on so many fronts. H how do you make that switch happen? So um, I've been asked that question a lot, and I um, I'm also spend a lot of time in Japan and Germany because their industrial companies have been uh, sitting there. So I, I think the way I look at it, the perfection is good. It's an incremental innovation. Typically, it's a craftsmanship. So when you are building some great products that are incremental innovating, Japanese and Germans are really the best, and Swiss, of course, as well. But the point, I think, is it's a culture. The problem is in those culture, when you want a drastic change and drop everything you've been doing mm -hmm. and try to change, it's hard. And Korea, actually, and Chinese, too. The advantage of Korea was they didn't have this long history of craftsmanship mm -hmm. because they kind of lost that during the war and dueling, you know, everything got blown away. So they have to review it. And I think it's the digitalization helped Korea to be the top 10 largest economy in the world now. Mm -hmm. Young, let's talk about your investment into Anybotics. That was Series B investment, big investment. What did you like about this company? You know, I think it's a very Swiss company that I liked as well, because it is a spin out of ETH, mm -hmm. a robotics lab great engineering talent, and we really like the team, and they want to do better, and they already have a strong customer traction uh, in the area of uh, industrial applications, which is very difficult to do. So they build things that are not only just robots that are walking around, for sure, like Boston, but they actually build something that are really working. And I'm hoping that it can deploy and save lives as they're going into the oil field, power stations, chemical plants, so that it can be able to really save lives in the, by replacing what robots can do, not just some pad or something just to, to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. We have the co-founder and the CEO here come on, come on up on stage. Peter. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Um, 
Peter, in terms of your experience of working with Young and the team and what advice you can give to other startups in Switzerland of how you attract such prominent investment from a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, what would you say? It's been certainly, you know, you need to have the willingness and the capacity to think global and go global. And you need to be able to show that, even though you might not have it yet, but just put it in your thoughts and your plans and your ambition. Can you take this company really to world leader and not only Switzerland or Dach region? I think that's been one of the fundamentals. And then working with Young and his team and others, it's been really fascinating just get this experience, just a due diligence. Those three months, we've learned so much. Those questions really made us think ahead. So putting yourself out and working and embarrassing this feedback has been a phenomenal experience. Fantastic. And for many startups, not just with startups, startups around the world, one of the biggest issues is scalability. You've got a great product, you've got a fantastic idea, you've got the funding for the most part, but then scalability. How much of an issue is that for you? As a robotics company, hardware plays a big role. And it's driven by a lot of software, but you need to have the platform. So we're already outsourced manufactured. That's been a, three, a key component in our strategy. Um, and right now, it's a lot of work goes into it and bringing people that come, you know, have seen deep tech in, in semiconductors and other areas. That's fundamental to take us to the next step. So it is a very big challenge. It takes a long breath, a lot of money. Um, but once you have it, you know, there's very high entry barriers. And I think here out of Switzerland, we have the capacity to build a world leader that combines software and hardware. Peter didn't have a gray hair. He un didn't? Until we had our due diligence process. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've been asking so many questions. <laughs> Tough questions, but uh, fruitful outcome. Peter, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let's talk geopolitics, because the, the panel or the, the speech that's coming up after this is all about that, and your industry is no stranger to that either. One of the biggest prominent VC investors in Silicon Valley, Sequoia, has just carved out the China unit. Mm -hmm. And that had a lot of people thinking, so what do we do? You know, as an, a US investor, we simply can't invest into China anymore? I think this is the uh, new reality, and I, I think depend on what you do, but particularly if you're touching technology areas, it's extremely sensitive. And, um, you know, last several years, it's gotten much worse. Uh, before, it was just about certain areas. Now the investment area is also expanding. So in a way, it's, in a way, it's decoupling investment perspective. But we didn't want that. We just wanted the de-risking, right? Exactly. But the difference between de-risking and decoupling is hard to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Ian can talk much more about this. But I can tell you a little bit about semiconductor industry, because that's the area that I'm involved in mm -hmm. as a uh, our largest semiconductor company, Samsung. And this is a real big problem. Yeah. Because the uh, number one, I don't know whether you know, 80% of chips that are consumed in the world comes from East Asia, between Korea and Taiwan and Japan, and China wants to be. So that is the source of 80% of chips. Without chips, nothing will work. The whole modern world will stop. And that's why some analysts and commentators will say, these tensions, these geopolitical tensions, it's all about dominance and chips. And some say, if China builds up its own supply chain and chips, if the U.S. does the same, well, China is no longer interested in, in Taiwan. Is it really that straightforward? Is it all about chips, this geopolitical? Well, chips is really a representation of your intellectual power, your AI capability, your software capability that are coming together. And today, the most valuable company in the um, chip now is NVIDIA. NVIDIA. And because of AI. And it enables all of you. Without that, you wouldn't be able to run your ChatGPT in an efficient manner. So it matters a lot. In a, in a race for technology, in a race for global competition, chip is the new enabler. And it's actually all the enablers that are really discovered. And I think it is the area of a big contention. And TSMC turned out to be the major supplier of that, along with Samsung mm -hmm. and Micron and others. So there is a lot of uh, 
decoupling or de-risking that are going on. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Micron because essentially Micron has been, well, banned from doing business in China. And they derive, I don't know, a quarter of their revenues from China. That, so that's a big deal for that U.S. chip maker. But wouldn't someone like Samsung Electronics just fill the gap? I mean, that's very opportunistic for others, not just Samsung, to come in and say, hey, you know, we'll take the place happily. Well, uh, you know, it depends on products. Some products are multi-sourced, so yes, but some products are single-sourced. Mm -hmm. If it's single-sourced product, then you are stuck with it, and you cannot run your machines. So um, um, I, I'm actually, I'm hoping that there will be a better the town, so the, so the, as a businessman, it's much better in terms of investment, in terms of the uh, decision-making, optimizing the resource. Today, it's very hard to navigate. We have to make, actually, big plant expansion in the U.S. because America wants to have their own source of chips, not from Asia. Mm -hmm. So that's another big source of redundancy that we have to create. Mm -hmm. So um, before I let you go, I want to come back and talk about funding. And, and again, this ties into geopolitics. Well, funding in the U.S. and the rest of the world, Western world, was down. A lot of funding came from the Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia. And of course, investors, many investors and funds were happy to take that investment because it's, it's a cash infusion. It's money. Is it socially acceptable, though? Well, you know, a few years ago, it was Russian funding. Was it acceptable then? Apparently, yes. Well, that's what's going on. We don't learn. Are you taking Saudi funding? Uh, no, uh, we don't have any Middle East money. All right. Let's get to uh, one or two last audience questions. How would you optimize the ecosystem of startups and large companies to produce more innovation? Well, that's a big question. I think the question of all the government and others. But I think it's about making sure there is a um, university relationship where because I think a lot of innovation come from universities in the U.S. And programs... And same in Switzerland. Exactly. So at TH, EPFR, like yesterday. Really important. And having a long-term uh, encouragement. But there's one thing I would say. there got to be incentive for entrepreneurs. Uh, I noticed in Germany, for instance, the moment you get stock options, which is a big incentive, you get taxed on a valuation they may not realize. Yeah. In fact, paying tax up front doesn't make any sense. Only when you make money, you should pay tax. And I think things like this have to change. And I, I think they're very much aware of that criticism and want to overhaul that. Final question, short answer, please. Does Europe focus too strongly on risks instead of pushing forward to exploit opportunities? I think the, I will just say that European technology uh, companies and talents are brilliant. How to harness has been a challenge, and that's the opportunity as well. Young Sun, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Best of luck. Best of luck to the startup scene. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.